Uh, hello, everyone. I know I am not sure if our facilitator can make it today. I think let me check. Last time I got from that message I got from Matthew is that he has a, a bit of an emergency. So he proposed that uh, because he wouldn't be able to present his chapter, that is chapter 14, sorry, 15. Uh, maybe we can take back the time that we uh, had the time for the last meeting, but I thought it was in a different schedule. But then we can take a look at chapter 14. Uh, what did we miss? So for that, I'm going to share my screen and I'll be using the notes from the previous cohort, but there was a, a little correction, it seems, or perhaps uh, during the time that the notes were grade, created for such, for this specific chapter, uh, maybe the content from the Master in Chinese book changed, and that's why there was a discrepancy between one of the solutions for the exercise. So uh, let us begin then. So this is chapter 14 of the Master in Shiny book. We will be dealing with the reactive graph. And what it explains is uh, how is the, how does the execution occur uh, in the code for our app? We know that the execution is different from a usual R script that is line above to line below. Uh, in this case, it's a bit or more, look, more like a event oriented programming but not fully in that way because there are also some uh, specific practices that Shiny has. So in this chapter, we're going to look at such practices. How does Shiny decide uh, which code to run, in which order, and when? Uh, maybe just a quick refresher about this reactivity uh, specific to Shiny. Uh, Let's see uh, this part. We 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 will be working with the reactive graph, so we need to familiarize ourselves with annotation. This type of ah, okay, this type of uh, geometric shape, we reserve that for inputs. Uh, this other shape, it has like a part coming in and a part coming out. We use that for reactive expressions, and this other and type of geometric shape. This one is specific, not only to outputs, but also to observers. Uh, however, in the explanations, <clears throat> whenever we mention outputs, or, or the author mentions out outputs, uh, really they also mean observers as well. So let's look at the first example. If we were to, to run this code, Supposedly, we would get this type of reactive graph. Uh, however, we don't really get the graph. Uh, just, for, just for you to, to believe me or, or to witness that, let's run this app. I have it over here. So it's the same application. Uh, I am simply using this function from the React log package in order to get a direct look at this type of graph. So let me run it. Wait. Okay. Let's see. Uh, we press Control S3, I think, in order to open the reactive graph. Sorry, the, no, yes, a reactive graph. And if we take a look at it, oh, wait, it's changed. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Uh, okay, that's weird because when I had uh, used use the same code and specifically part of the plot output and I use a React log package, over here we, we got another type of inputs that they're usually uh, used for the type of plot that you're generating because you need a couple more uh, variables to describe it, like width and height. So in the reactive graph, there was also other type of inputs not just the one uh, show over here in this part of the chapter, but it seems to work fine. So uh, let's just work with this one then. The only difference is really this one over here, seam counter. Um, I think we work 
with this type of input before, or perhaps it, it was in the Shiny UI uh, book lab, but it's related to a specific bootstrap scene that you are assigning to, to Shiny. In this case, uh, we're not really taking that into consideration. So let's assume that it doesn't exist. And um, just to have a little more of a match between this type of reactive graph, maybe let's move around these inputs. As you can see, input A, input B, input C. And over here, maybe let's say the, the ones just a little bit. Uh, our, up, to, up to this is okay. If not, we, we will get an our complication. It's not necessary. Okay. So I would I want to to share another scene. So let me only share this screen. Uh, and wait, can you see anything? We see the notes. The the book in the browser. Yes. Okay. Uh, what I want, I want to work with some notes, like tell you about this. Uh, are you looking at VS Code right now? No, it's still the book. Okay, great. So. Wait, but the blog has to move. Ah, yeah, it's okay. Okay, so let's go into how does this reactive graph works. So how does Shiny decide which code to execute? Um, well, we could look at the pictures as we can see in the book, but uh, because really this reactive graph is basically the same as the one that we have over here. Instead of just uh, like believing that these things are happening, we can actually see that those things are happening and we can actually follow also the step at which they are occurring. So we can begin with this part. So what is the initial step our, after our Shiny app has begun executing? Well, the first step is invalidation. So the session has begun. So now outputs and reactive expressions being in an invalidated state and this invalidated invalidated state means two different things. For the output, it means that such output should be executed as soon as Shiny gets a chance. However, for reactive expressions, it means that this code must execute the next time that this value is requested. So really what we what we will start the execution is this part of the outputs. In the case we have three, uh, well, we can consider that Shiny, Shiny randomly chooses which of the outputs to execute. It may be the case that maybe the execution of one output affects the execution of the other. Uh, however, even in those cases, there should be some dependency within those outputs. As we can see, this dependency in this case is labeled via these graphs, sorry, via these lines that they are going to be drawn in, in one of the next steps. So even in that specific case of dependency between outputs, it's okay that we can start from any output. The dependency will take will take care of them by themselves. So in this case, we I will show the next step via clicking on this button. And as you can see, the first output has been invalidated. The second output is being invalidated right now. As we can see, it's in like a darker gray. Um, from this part over here, there is a description of what's, what, which state does this color represent. So now the second output is being invalidated, and now simply a third one. Now, the next step is the execution of one of the outputs, really our observers. In this case, just outputs. So this specific one, the output with ID X, is getting executed. That, that's what it means uh, for it to have an orange color. So during the execution of this output, this one in particular, it needs some code. In particular, it needs the result 
PV by the reactive expression. So the next step would be to start executing such reactive expression. As you can see, or right here, it tells a, drawn, a line has been drawn because this output, sorry, this, react, this reactive expression uh, is a dependency of this output. So it requires, uh, it's a value required for this output to finish its execution. So a line has been drawn to label that. And now the execution will begin for the code associated to such a specific reactive expression. Now for this specific expression, we can see that it's going to be, it's going to need uh, this, this type of values. As we can see by following the lines, the value related to the input V and the value related to the output of this reactive expression. So similarly to the output, it needed some code. So such code started executing. In this case, when we go to the next step, we have over here another arrow because the output of these specific reactive expressions is necessary for this other one. So this one, this reactive expression is a dependency of this, I'm sorry, it's not working. Okay, this reactive expression, it's a dependency of this one over here. So now this has been invalidated. So the next step would be to start executing its code. And similarly, what, what does this reactive expression need as in order to finish its code execution? Well, it's simply, as we can see from the line as well, uh, the value of this input A. So it directly reads such value. There is no need to invalidate in this step uh, this input A and that represents the value of this. Uh, I think it was called numeric something. Let me see. Of this numeric input, sir. Okay. However, as you can see, the the calculation has not has not finished for this specific reactive expression. This one over here. So really, what are the next steps? We have this input. It was all that this reactive expression needed. So we can finish the execution of this one. And now this reactive expression is going to change into an idle state. And that means that because it has completed its execution, then the value for this reactive expression is going to be saved or catch it. I don't know how to say it, so I will simply write it. It's maybe it's catch. It's term over here in the in the chat. So I will simply call it saved. Uh, and the idea that 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 value has been saved is that uh, after returning this value over here to the well to the reactive expression or to the output that requested it. In this case, this one this one was the one that made the request. After returning it, then this, this reactive expression over here has, has entered a state in which no re-execution is going to occur. And whenever the value for this one is going to be asked, then it will simply return the value that we've already stored, the value that was calculated the first time that it was asked or requested. So again, that's how we can make sure that there is no uh, redundancy when we are executing code. So it, there is only going to be code execution when we really, really uh, need, need it to, to do so. Okay, but now still the, the, out, sorry, the state of this reactive expression over here, it's not still an idle state because it is still, it's missing one variable in this case. As you can see from the code, it's a value of the input V. So that would be the next step to retrieve such value. And now it can finish its calculation and enter the ready state. So again, it happens the same to what happens to, it happens the same for these reactive expressions to what happened to this one over here. It will simply return a catch value unless it has to re-execute its code. So now, 
the value for the output of this record expression is going to be passed, passed sorry, to the output that requested it. And okay. in that case, then this output also has also finished its, its code calculation, sorry, its code execution. And so it also enters an idle state. Now, this, out, this specific output, it's now in an idle state. So now we have to do this whole process, sorry, this similar process for another output. In this case, probably this one will start its execution output Y. And as we can see, it's not going to take as long as for the other one, as for output X, because in this next step, it is asking for the value of this reactive expression. But such reactive expression, it's in green, it's in an idle state. So the only thing that it has to do is return a, it's already saved value. So no, no execution has to happen. The inputs having, sorry, any, all of its dependencies uh, have not changed the state. They, they remain to be idle. So they remain to be colored in green. So just return the previous output value. And now for the other output, the, the last one that hasn't achieved the idle state, it begins its execution. And, well, in this case, it, it is kind of similar to the first one of the output X. It's simply asking for values. We we also grab, sorry, we also draw these lines to, to determine who is a dependency of who. And now that all of these outputs, these three of those, have finished their execution, then the app enters on what is called an idle state, as we can see right here. Uh, and well, and the author he describes this shiny app idle state in a kind of physical, uh, like terminology. And so let me read the reference. He says, uh, "Now that a session has entered the idle state." Uh, nothing will happen with this session until until some external force acts. Sorry, until some external force acts on the system. Uh, we mean for something like if the user changes the value of some input value. Sorry, or the value of some input. So something like if I were to change this value input b, maybe increase it by one. Um, so what is the outcome of, of changing that input? As I, as I did for this one, it started with one, but I changed it to two. So how does the reactive graph react? Um, well, over here, I think when I try to do these changes, like I'm doing right now for input B, there doesn't seem to be some change for the, for the reactive graph that we can see. So maybe in this part we can follow along the uh, well the, the images shown in the book, uh, and this is, this is what happens. So we change some input. In this case, they are changing. Uh, I think that is input A. Um, yeah, they are changing input A, and so the input has changed. So the first the first uh, phase for the new steps of the reactive graph is what is called the invalidation phase. That is, which input changed? It was this one, input A. Okay, so that one is going to be invalidated. So we color it in green. And starting from such invalidation state, uh, what we will do is that we will follow the arrows that as we can see, they were created as the code execution was occurring. And we will follow the arrows and change the state of every input, sorry, of every reactive expression or output that we get from following those arrows and change the state to an invalidated one. So we start from here, we go to this reactive expression. So now for this reactive expressions, uh, we change the state to I no sorry to invalidate it, and we also remove all of these arrows, entering into this one, so this one over here, and all the arrows coming out of this one. 
So in this case, it would be this one over here. Now for the now for the arrow that we had that we erased earlier, we also perform the same. So in this case of the reactive expression, we remove all the arrows coming in to it. So these two, and also the arrows coming out of it. So this one over here. Uh, and similarly, now where does this one? Where do these arrows point to? To these specific outputs. So this get invalidated, and then we we remove these arrows as well. So we can see they they were first invalidated, pulling the pulling the arrows, and then the after after invalidating such inputs or or reactive expressions or outputs a cache of servers, then the arrows are removed. And now we get a similar state, uh, like when we begun, our input has now changed from invalidated to idle. So it's ready to be read, its value of such input. And now we have some inputs, sorry, some outputs or observers uh, that, that have an invalidated state. So really, uh, what happens next is just what we did in the beginning. So this output is invalid, it's invalidated. Okay, so we start its execution. It's going to, to draw a, it's going to need, sorry, the value for this reactive expression. So then some arrow is going to be drawn. Then this reactive expression over here is going to need the value of this also, of this another reactive expression. So uh, a, a line is going to be drawn and also uh, this reactive expression will start its code execution. So really it's just the same steps as we did in the beginning. And we repeat that until all of the outputs have reached an idle state so that its code has finished and its code has finished. And once again, we reach the, what it is, what it is over here, the shiny app idle state that we have already described. What, what does it mean? Uh, well, and that's really it for what is happening in, in in a simple case like like this, uh, like this specific application or here. Well, that it looks like this. But uh, but some main idea. Uh, well, next uh, there were some exercises that I wanted to to finish. But are there any questions or comments? Okay. No questions. Thanks. Okay. So maybe let's let's take a look at the exercises. Uh, I will need to to share my full screen. So let me stop sharing right now. Um, wait, how do I share all of um, Okay, so what can you see right now? We see your browser. I think okay, there's so an option see. to share desktop. Uh, maybe I will just limit myself to one screen. I, I am still not used to having multiple. So just to make sure I will share again. Okay. So let's close this specific application that we have used um, as an example of what's going on. Oh, I just saw your VS code. I don't know if... Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's take a look at these exercises. First, uh, well, they, they ask us to draw the reactive graph for this application. Uh, well, this is a server part. The input, I assume that it's the same one as the one that was, well, described over here in the beginning. Uh, let's come back. This one. So if we were to change the UI for, sorry, the server for these specific numeric inputs, uh, what would happen? 
Well, we can copy and paste uh, that. Let's see, it's, no, it's not over here. Okay, it's over here. Yeah, we can copy this code. It's really this part over here, the server. Um, as I mentioned, we can assume that the UI is the, the one that was defined before, okay, except for those specific outputs. So really only these, only these specific numeric inputs. Okay, so he says, after you draw the reactive graph, explain why are the reactives uh, not getting executed. So why is this some broad and division reactive not getting executed? Uh, let's first take a look at if that really is the case. So maybe let's enable the react log sorry the reactive graph for this specific cap okay i will run this up again and as you can see nothing is happening but maybe let's take a look at the reactive graph so is there anything happening um no still no and that really it has to be because of what was the first state sorry the first state i'm oh, sorry the second state uh, when we start for Shania. The first one was invalidation of outputs and reactive expressions. But then when code execution started, uh, it didn't start with the reactive expressions. It, it started with either outputs or, or observers. However, as we can see in the app, uh, really there is no, uh, no output. In this case, they are coming to talk, but because in this specific example, as we can see right here, there was really never a mention of if an output was required. So we can assume that there were, there is no output for this app. And that is why there is no output. So there is no, there is not something that triggers the start of the code execution. However, if we were to add, to add some output, so maybe like, yeah, some output for some, code result and well what we will print into such a specific output it will simply be the the output value of this specific reactive expression so now that we change the app we, we give it an output and we execute it again maybe let's draw that reactive graph again uh, now as you can see it has been created and all of the connections have been established due to this uh, app now having at least one output. And that is also what I mentioned in the access in the solution provided by a previous cohort. And the app didn't show anything in the beginning because well, the starting state is invalidated. Uh, and also, well, we should that that execution starts due to outputs or observers, not just and due to reactive expressions. So uh, maybe we should add that. It, it wants, it, it, if someone wants to do a pull request later on. Now, this is a, the exercise where there was a difference between my solution and the one in the slides. It could be because maybe the, the book changed. Uh, however, let's look at what is a, at least exercise right now in the current version of the book. So we have three reactive values, x1, x2, x3. A, each of them begin with some specific value. Um, we define also three reactives and we're going to be making use of sleep. So that's going to be like a waiting some specific time of seconds before the execution of the next line. In this case, the next line would be X1 before the execution of such line occurs. So in this case, for this specific reactive expression, we wait one second and then we execute this reactive expression. Or here similarly, we wait one second and again we execute this other reactive. Sorry, we get the value of this other reactive value. Where here also we get the value of the reactive value X1. And for this last last reactive expression. 
uh, we wait one second and then we simply return the value as the sum of these uh, three reactive values. And again, we need an output or an observer in order for the app to run. No, in order for the app to start executing our code, well, well not really. Uh, I, I want to be very precise because we just learned in, in this morning that there is a mark code that it's, it is already being executed before the app is, no, sorry, as the app is being created. So to be more precise, we need an output or an observer uh, in order for some R code. No, in, in order for the reactive graph to be drawn. I, I will I will leave it at that because uh, it's, I find it very hard to, to be precise about this. Uh, it's due to shiny technicalities that we just learned in in, uh, in in the shiny UI book club. Okay, okay, but maybe just yeah, simply let's run this up. Uh, however, we don't have, uh, let's see. Let's this one over here. Mm, yeah. Mm. No, okay, so if you if we were to only run this app using this code, well, we don't have an input. So there's not anything, I mean, the app will be blank. So I will just mention the verification that I did because we need to determine the following. Uh, how long does the graph that is a reactive graph take in order to in order to recompute if the value for this specific reactive value changes, and similarly, if this reactive value changes, uh, how many seconds do they pass for the graph to be recomputed, and similarly for this reactive value x three. So we need to know. Sorry, we need a way in order to modify these reactive values x one, x two, and x three. And what that is simply what I have defined in the input, sorry, in the UI. So there are some radio buttons uh, and we present a choice to select the reactive value one, the reactive value two, or the reactive value three. Uh, and by three, I mean X3. And then, then when we select one of those specific reactive values, uh, maybe say for example, X1, this is also the same code as, as we just saw. But I am adding uh, a, a little bit of part in this code for the observer, but let's first focus on, on this one. So what happens once that we have selected some specific reactive value? In this case, we were, we were selecting X1. So we only want this thing to execute. X1, ah, let me zoom in a little bit. X1, then this, and then add one. And we're what we are doing with this specific line of code is really if we are updating the value of the reactive value X1, we are simply adding one to it. So it would be perhaps in a more simpler form, something like X1, it redefine its value to its current value, but add one. However, if we were to execute this we would create an infinite loop because as soon as we call this, they get executed. But when we execute this, we're also calling it. So it's like a call execute, call execute, and it never stops. Um, well, what it is mentioned in the next chapter is in, but in order to stop that infinite loop, you can sur surround this uh, reactive expression, or in this case, a reactive value via the isolate function. So now we are simply uh, are updating the value of the reactive value X1. We are adding one to it. So this is the only thing that we are doing. If we, if we had chosen X2, then we would add one to the X2 reactive value. But in order to do that, uh, I am simply doing some eval parse, like hack in quotes, in, in order to to perform that, but it doesn't matter 
Right. How does it look? The idea is that it's performing adding one to the selected directory file. It's only doing that. And also we simply ask to a message, what is the practice value that it's getting updated? Okay, and here is the important part. We could determine what are these waiting times simply via the reactive graph, but still we can confirm it. And we, we, can, we can make those confirmations pasting what is the current time at some point in the calculation, and then what is the current time at another point of the calculation. So if I were to, to, to obtain what is the current time, well, we can do that via the this time function. And because this is going to happen super fast, I mean, we really only need a current time and, and minutes. So if we execute this function, we get this string, but as you can see over here, we don't really know, we don't really need all of their characters. So we can do something like only give us the characters related to minutes and seconds. So 30, 38 minutes and 36 seconds, like that is the current time. And so really the last part is really just that. So uh, whenever this reactive expression, this one, or this other reactive expression changes, uh, this code is going to be going to be executed. So what it does is first it show show us current minute and second, then it executes the y one reactive expression and prints its value. Then because the execution of y one has finished, well, what is the current time? So get minutes and seconds. Then it starts execution of Y2. And now that it has finished such, such execution, well, what is the current minute and time? Oh, and similarly for Y3, execute it and then show us current minute and time. So let me, let me run this up. Uh, let's see what happens. I need to close some scenes over here. Uh, let me share this. Um, okay. Uh, wait, wait. Okay. So no, yet. No, it's okay. So I'm going to click on X2. I uh, remember, remember what it does is going to update the value. So as we can see, it's going to trigger which reactive. Well, which is using X2, only Y2 and Y3. So I will change X2. Uh, well, what happens? X2 uh, execution started at this point. We retrieve the value of Y1. Then Y1 finishes execution. And as we can see, uh, it's like there was uh, such a short time between this part and this one that no second I mean, that such short time was smaller than a second. So it's, it looks like if no time had occurred at all, but it did. Then it executes the Y2 reactive expression. It finished such execution. And now what is the current time? 40 and 27. So there was a, a weight of zero for Y1, as we can see, this one minus this one. But for Y2, one second elapsed. So for from 427, no, oh sorry, from 426 to 427, there is one second of difference. Um, for Y3, in this case, it's a finishes execution at that time. This one, so as we can see, two seconds passed since the point that we changed the value of X1 up to the point that we finished the execution for Y3. So two seconds for for two for the X2 reactive value. Two seconds had to pass for the reactive graph to, to be updated. That is for all of this code to finish executing. For X3, let's see, it started at this specific time. And for Y1, 
uh, it's like no second past at all for y2 also like no second past at all and that makes sense because x3 is only present over here for y3 so when y1 and y2 are called there is no execution that needs to for we just retrieve the last value uh, that each specific reactive no if each specific reactive expression uh, returned as an output so no execution happens it only happens for y3 because the x3 reactive value it's a dependency of it and so in that case we simply wait one second as we can see over here we change x3 we edit one to it so this was the starting time when we did that and after the whole process has been has, sorry has finished so that the reactive graph has been redrawn only one second passed and now we well we can check the the uh, the similar case for x1 so we add one to x to x1 um, again 43 20 is the starting time and by the time we have finished only two seconds have passed and again that makes sense because uh let's see wait x1 okay only one second has passed because why well because x1 is only a dependency of which practice expression of this one so again, when Y2 and Y3 are called, no code execu execution happens. So really the only sys slip that is being executed is a one over here for Y1. And we can check in this part. One second passed. Okay. Uh, well, that's it for this, for this specific application. So, Let's see if there was another one. Ah, uh, well, this is a code that I just showed you. Uh, the third, uh, the last exercise. Ah, uh, it's the thing that I just showed you. So they say, what happens if you attempt to create a reactive graph with this type of cycles? So you define some reactive value that starts with a value of one. Then you define some reactive expression that outputs the x plus the, sorry, what? That plus its own call, and then you execute it. So well, as you execute it, it's going to call on itself. So you execute it, it calls up in, on itself, so you need to execute it again. But then when you execute it, again, it's, it is calling on itself. So you, one, once more time, you have to call it, sorry, one, you have to execute it again. And as you can see, it's an infinite loop. And that's what that's what they mean by recursion. It's an infinite loop. Uh, well, this part of dynamism and the React Lock package, we, we have already covered this because I was working with the React Lock package as I showed you the example of the other of the other examples of in particular of this introductory app that we work with. So we already, we already covered that. So really as a summary, we can, we can see how, how the code execution is being managed for a shiny application using the React Lock package. We simply included this line in our app and then we pressed and a specific keyboard command in order to take a look at that reactive graph. Uh, the validation cycle already so why it is important. It helps up, it helps us update the app by doing the minimum amount of effort, of effort that is minimum minimum amount of a uh, code re execution. Um, and again, we already work with this package, so that's really it. Uh, I have nothing else to add. So really just yes, thank you for your time. Thank you, Lucio. Thank you so much, Lucio. Um, so
Sorry, guys, I had to come in a bit late. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, 13 minutes left. Um, we'll not be able to do so much on the other chapter. Save we just uh, prepare. next week, we would um, have to shift the dates, and next week, we'll meet for chapter 15. Um, thank you so much, guys. I have a question. Um, I know you guys had mentioned before skipping the best practices section. Are we still doing that or are we gonna go through the whole book? Okay, so um, not just me now. I think it's a thing we should all decide on now. Um, should we just go through the whole book? Just as Lydia has asked. Well, if you I want think to... so, yeah. because the, the, the part about training models that, that is in the best practice part, I mean, it seems to be very, very important. I mean, modularization of a code, it's basically what happens all the time that when you're working with a big enough app, so it seems very useful. Okay, cool. Just checking. Yeah, I should still be able to present maybe like three weeks from now. And yeah, I heard at ShinyConf, like briefly that Shiny modules is something people like using. Okay, so um, since we were taking, going through all the chapters, I think that's a, a good one. Um, as regards to the model thing, um, I think Emily mentioned it during the Shiny conference. I think that's what her talk was centered on. She mentioned the importance of modularization. <clears throat> and uh, it's been nice if, we have agreed, and I think that's just the best thing. We just go through it together. If there's nothing else to add, okay. Oh no, I didn't have. Yeah, I was thinking that's great. Okay. Okay, if there's nothing more to add, um, we'll meet again next week. And um, thank you so much, everyone, for turning up again. It was wonderful, Trevin. Hi. Thank you. Bye. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you. See you. Bye.